On the subject of COVID vaccine, our next guest is definitely a pioneer. She is a recipient of the PMAC 2021 uh, award. So, well, let's start off. When you first came to the States, um, what were you working on? So in Hungary, I work with uh, RNA already as a, a graduate student. So my PhD, I did a nucleoside modified actually RNA, but those were short RNA. And I get a position at Temple University in Philadelphia to work on uh, different uh, small RNA molecules. And actually my professor actually, he wrote a textbook on modified nucleosides. So uh, I was reading earlier that mRNA is not very stable and also immunogenic. At the beginning, I didn't see that I have a problem. So uh -huh. because the deliver the RNA to the brain and other uh, in the animal model, and I couldn't see the problem. But when I met with the Drew Weissman and he used human immune cells, then we could see that uh, the mRNA we are using is inflammatory. And uh, you know, he was happy thinking that it was good for vaccine. I was crying that that's not good for therapy. And so that's why we started to understand how, why it is, and whether we can change it. And uh, eventually we purchased a modified nucleoside containing, uh, 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 we purchased a, a, a nucleoside triphosphate, which were already modified. And that's what we incorporated to RNA when we discovered that modification is needed to reduce or eliminate the uh, immune activation by the RNA. And this was, uh, we discovered by, you know, again, many, many experiments and uh, visualizing that when we use the transfer RNA, a type of RNA, which is very enriched, modified nucleoside, that type of RNA was not immunogenic at all. Mm. So we get the idea from, from nature, just like the mRNA. We did not create the mRNA as a vaccine that we come up with a molecule. It is a nature. It is mm. we, in our body, every cell has messenger RNA. How many years did you spend doing research before this COVID vaccine came to fruition? Oh, <laughs> it's more than 40 years, you know, and yeah. I was working with lipids as an undergraduate in the 70s. And from 78, I worked with RNA, shorter RNA, which had antiviral effect. And then from 89, so it was like 30 years working, uh, you know, with, um, uh, with, uh, with messenger RNA. Okay, and in the beginning, I heard that it was very difficult to get funding and grants to do your research. It was so difficult that I never get. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so it was um, because, uh, you know, that um, it was too novel and too risky, and um, I always had to generate more data, more data they were asking, and, and I understand that I was not upset. You know, every time I look at there, what can I do? And that was important. So the RNA needed to improve, so more protein is made from it, which would be, you know, therapeutic, useful. How do you go through all the dry period of, <laughs> uh, of the funding and the money to mm. do research? I had to just convince one more colleague who would support my, who would pay my salary, which was quite low. So it was a, like a technician salary I received, but I always found. In cardiology, one colleague paid when I was lost that job and went to neurosurgery, another colleague, uh, Grant, supported my uh, research. And, um, and then they were enthusiastic about the mRNA and they also had ideas that what we should do. And, and so this encouragement, when I had at least one person to support me and be enthusiastic with me, it was already good enough. I see. Well, so it was a struggle. It was constant struggle to, to go on. But I have to tell you that it is from outside it looks like that because when it was in the, at the bench in the laboratory and then I could see the improvement, it was, it was a lot of joy. Mm. So I hope that, uh, you know, the young people who are looking at, they see that part, the mm. joy, because science, when you are at the bench, you are doing experiment, you are in control. Mm. And this is fun. Yeah, as a woman, as an immigrant mm. to the U.S., well, I guess you have, did you have to work harder or struggle more <laughs> to to get through all, all that? You know, usually for women is harder because uh, you know they try to be a good wife, good mother, good daughter, good sister, whatever role we have. And and um, I I have a good husband who supported uh, uh, you know and helped me. Mm. So he realized that you know I have 
dreams and then he he un understand that. And well, I heard your daughter is two-time Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> How did that come about? Yes, she was first in uh, <laughs> the champion in our family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, she was uh, in um, in uh, university, and she started in uh, when she was 19 years old, starting at the university rowing, and she was strong, and um, and in three four years already she was you know in the uh, already the U.S. national team, and um, from 2005 to 2015, 10 years she was the U.S. national rowing team. And she was five times world champion, two times Olympic champion, so... <laughs> Wonderful. <Yes. laughs> you didn't do anything to her genetics, did you? <laughs> no, <laughs> you just know, just that's the other thing, you know, I, I am telling to yes. also to, to many of the other, you know, women that, you know, they might have to choose between their career and family, that mm. you don't have to, you mm. know, you can have both. Mm. I did not, uh, you know... S serve my daughter, you know, mm. she learned independent to, to be and get up in the morning, do her breakfast, even when she was uh, in grade school. Okay, wonderful. I mean, if you can say a few more words and uh, advice to the younger generations <laughs> and the future scientists, oh. what, would you, what would you tell them? First of all, the most important thing, they have to love what they are doing, because mm. you will do every day. And if you love it, you will be good at it. And if mm. you are good at it, you enjoy it. So yes. that's very important. And I would say also, you know, the intimidation, which is very easy to feel. Can you imagine, I came from a small town, 10,000 people. My father was a butcher. Mm. My parents had only elementary school education. Mm. Going to an Ivy League school and look around, you know, everybody is so smart, everybody. And then you can feel this, oh my God, you know, what am I doing here? Mm. So, but you have to believe in yourself that I can be like them. And that's so that's very important, not to settle for less. You know, the bar put high. And then you can be that professor there who is there. Even you are coming from a small town. I grew up in really a, a, a one room we had and um, we had no running water, no refrigerator, no television. And um, I can be here. Wonderful. Looking back, you must be proud. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel I would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your life story. And I think it's, uh, I say it for everyone that you have our admiration. <laughs> and uh, thank you again for coming on this interview and hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that was Professor Katie Carrico, the recipient of the 2021 Prince Mahidon Award. Stay tuned and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.